Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy, and I am the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. Uh, it's a center that helps people withdraw from psychiatric medication and use uh, natural alternatives to help offset addictive biochemistries that lead them towards having certain cravings. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, a particular drug called Celexa. And we're going to be answering a few questions so that uh, viewers can better understand what this drug is. So the first question is, what is Celexa? <clears throat> well, Celexa is also known as citalopram. Citalopram and Celexa are SSRIs. And um, what an SSRI means, as far as the explanations that we've been given um, through the uh, pharmaceutical companies and some other molecular biologists and neurophysiologists, is that um, basically how the nervous system works overall. If, if there's a, 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 the necessity for one nerve to talk to another, how it does so is through uh, chemical um, expression. So that, I mean, in its simplest sense, what that means is you've got the resting state of a nerve. In order for there to be a nerve conduction, the millivolts needs to be lessened so that there's less resistance so that a nerve transmission can happen. So a drug like Celexa makes it so that there's a bit of neuromodulation so that that depolarization is not as likely. And how it does that, how it's believed to do that, is by inhibiting um, the breakdown of serotonin. So serotonin is a neuromodulator that it is a natural neurochemical that will uh, produce that inhibitory neuromodulation. Serotonin is, it's not truly an antidepressant. People have misconceived it because of all the creative marketing from the pharmaceutical companies to believe that serotonin is a um, antidepressant. It's more of an anti-impulsivity neurochemical. So its softening effect looks like dampening um, obsessive thinking, you know, like our brainstem, uh, which has the bandwidth of a reptile, really. I mean, it's probably more advanced than that, but it it doesn't have a really complicated diplomacy, um, basal ganglions and things like that. It's just really geared towards like fight or flight, um, killing, defending. Um, it doesn't really re have a lot of reasoning power. So when we get an impulsive thought that comes up, the higher centers of our brain where serotonin is expressed and utilized has more of a diplomacy effect and instead of killing someone or um, pouncing on something, you know, you um, maybe figure out how that person is different than you or get their Facebook contact, you know, so you can, you know, form a relationship with them over time, that kind of thing. So a person who is serotonin deficient <laughs> would feel things like um, impulsive behaviors that might lead them to act on suicidal thoughts, um, ruminate about things of a fight or flight nature because they don't have the dampening effect for that. And also, since serotonin forms melatonin, uh, the, the, they could have an impact on your sleep. So if you're serotonin deficient, you have um, a, a problem uh, with sleep. Generally, the type of sleep that um, either uh, is pronounced by the, the inability to stay asleep. It sometimes can also be the inability to fall asleep. But um, usually, that transition into melatonin is what keeps you asleep when you're in a dark room and not being affected by light and blipping this is and that's um which can affect your sleep as well so um now back to what selexa does to serotonin so selexa um in the synapse you have a you have a part of your uh uh uh, uh, uh the nerve synapse that holds the um, neurochemicals that part would be here that's called the vesicles right so if you can imagine on this side you've got these little storage containers that hold serotonin that are going to, when needed, release those so that they can touch onto these receptors over here and cause an inhibitory effect so that whatever stimulus is coming through is sort of buffered a little bit so it's not quite as intense. So it expresses it, it lets it out to touch these receptors. Then the natural recycling process is so that these receptors then let go of the serotonin because it's done its job and it goes back into the vesicles where it can be used again. This is a recycling process, this reuptake process. If this recycling process is not um, occurring, in other words, the, there's an enzyme called serotoninase that will break the serotonin off of here so that it can then be um, reused. 
the drug is more or less poisoning that enzyme. So it's being forced to stay out there where um, in theory, um, it will degrade into its metabolites, which means it's not, it's not serotonin anymore. It's going to be, um, uh, you're, basically you're using up the serotonin. You're, the drug is not making serotonin, it's spending it. And most drugs actually do that. Um, a good example would be cocaine. Um, cocaine doesn't make dopamine. It doesn't make this, everything's rewarding. It's spending what's already there. And then, um, I don't know, for those who have seen Al Pacino's Scarface, there's a point where the, the cocaine just doesn't work anymore. And for some people, the um, Selexa and other SSRIs can do the same thing over time. For some people, they seem to be able to manage it. You know, um, that it's not uh, that it's not um, completely depleting them and they're still able to function. And other people are different. They're they they probably the people that really had this serotonin problems in the first place. They it's spending what's there and then they're bankrupt and then they're um, uh, potentially even in a worse situation than they were before. Um, another thing that can happen with SSRIs, which is uh, become quite the. Um, fodder for uh tragedies i mean you know um the a lot of the school shootings a lot of the um i we take a lot of phone calls we hear things i've heard things that have even after 15 years of 20,000 different conversations um you know when you hear a parent that has murdered their children in a disinhibited state um looking for help and they they wake up in jail and they don't even remember what happened and you know that that parent by other accounts has been a loving parent you know you you uh you have to wonder what's going on with certain people there are certain people it's it doesn't seem to be that many but even if it's one in a million when you're talking 300 million people uh that level of inhibition that can cause people to go um in a dreamlike state and do things that they would probably have never done um not under the influence of of uh of these type of medications. Um, you know, these are things that may not even be picked up in the drug studies because the population base isn't big enough to find that. And interestingly enough, when they do the phase one trials on drugs, they they exclude people that have had um, the, the outliers, people that have had either an extremely good effect or an extremely bad effect. Those people get sectioned off. And the secondary trial, um, which is phase two, uh, deals with the median type folks. and. Um, I don't remember the last time I've been able to have a patient just be pushed out to the bus stop if something bad happened. I mean, those outliers are your patients too. So it seems a little unrealistic and unrealistic the drug trials that um, uh, deem efficacy or um, validity for these type of medications. Um, <clears throat> question number two, what is Selexa prescribed for? Uh, Selexa has a bit narrower prescribing range. Uh, it's really to treat depression. Uh, other drugs may have a more um, robust profile of things that they're meant to treat. But Selex is pretty straight down the line for um, um, depression. Uh, question number three, what is the difference between Zoloft and Selexa? Well, recently they found out that Zoloft has a bit of a dopaminergic effect, um, which they didn't expect. So it Zoloft has a has a very robust profile of things that it is prescribed for. Um, Selexa, the main thing I would say is Selexa has a longer half-life than Zoloft. That makes it a um, different type of drug. So having a half-life of up to 48 hours, which is uh, about the, the range of Selexa, uh, puts it in a different category of Zoloft, which has maybe half of that. So Zoloft will leave your system a lot quicker. Um, which can mean that it doesn't have <clears throat> as many, if, if you can't metabolize a drug real well, at least for most people, it'll leave the system a lot quicker. Um, but it also makes it a lot harder to get off of the Zoloft leaving faster. So Selexa would be theoretically easier to get off of um, than um, most of the other antidepressants of the SSRI class. Um, <clears throat> question number four. Is Selexa hard to withdraw from compared to other SSRIs? Uh, we sort of covered that in... Prozac is probably the easiest one. Um, Selexa is better than most because of the longer half-life. 
So if it is supported well, a selective withdrawal is generally easier than other medications. If you're watching this video, there's probably a good chance that you're struggling with the selective withdrawal. And I, I, I um, um, just the, people struggle with a lot of these medication withdrawals. I mean, they, they're, it's, it's completely underreported and pushed under the carpet for the most part when people have bad reactions to these drugs or coming off of them. But on a scale, um, the, the, the Selex is generally, honestly, better than most. So, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably because of its half-life. Um, <clears throat> number five, uh, what are natural Selexa alternatives? You know, this is a question that doesn't really fit the bullet point thing. You know, even um, some of our, some of on, on Alternative to Med's website, some of the um, pages that we have for Selexa alternatives or Prozac alternatives um, have made it to the number one position. And there's a snippet that they put at the number one position before you even click open. And usually they will have chosen, Google will have chosen some bullet point thing that's like, you know, a five step or six step thing. It doesn't really work like that. There's not like, a, oh, you just do these alternatives and for whatever you took Selexa for, that's the alternative. I mean, there's, there's an investigative work that is necessary to understand what are you suffering from? Is it a serotonin deficiency? Well, you probably never honestly figure that out because there isn't a there is not um, a lab test that's gonna tell you that. Even the neurotransmitter tests that they do have, the blood tests even, are not a true representation of what's happening in your brain. So there's no test that's gonna really tell if it's a serotonin deficiency in the first place. But some of the serotonin alternatives would be things like tryptophan and 5-HTP. 5-HTP and tryptophan are the direct precursors towards making serotonin. Um, serotonin, as I mentioned before, goes on to make melatonin. Um, so melatonin is sort of in that same pathway of, uh, of serotonin friends and uh, a little bit of niacin actually backs up this um, pathway a bit. So taking a combination of either 100 milligrams of niacin and 50 to 150 milligrams of uh, tryptophan, excuse me, of 5-HTP or 500 to 1500 milligrams of tryptophan is sort of like what you would consider the natural alternative to a... Um, serotonin reuptake inhibiting drug. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons why people are depressed. I mean, it could be thyroid problems. It could be because you're surrounded by people in your life that just are not good people. It could be because of um, uh, inflammation, uh, allergenic foods in your diet. I mean, that's has become quite common for people to get slowed down. It could be from drinking too much coffee. I mean, there's a certain point where there's not any adrenaline left in your adrenals to keep dumping coffee on and it's you know coffee honestly is a drug too so um lifestyle changes it's it, it's um there's a lot of alternatives honestly i mean exercise is 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 uh how we actually detoxify we're actually having to increase our blood pressure in order to um move certain um, metabolites of, of daily daily just um a day's metabolism through our system on a cellular level by increasing our blood pressure. So there's a lot of different alternatives. It's not just a one size fits all thing. And um, a lot of people who have been on drugs are sort of looking for that, oh, I need this thing that's gonna fix my dot, 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 and bullet point it out. But it's, um, it really is good to see a natural professional, someone who is attuned to working with the natural systems of the body and can do lab tests and can you know um, follow your care in that way that um, has a deeper investigative work than just drugging the situation. Um, last question, what helps with Selexa tapering? Um, <clears throat> well, one of the ways we do it here because the drug itself can cause, well, we believe, I, I don't wanna state it as like some sort of universal law, but in our observations clinically, we have come to the um, belief that um, people who have taken SSRIs are generally serotonin bankrupt. They may not be in the very beginning, but over a period of time, it looks like that. <clears throat> so what we see when people are tapering off the Selexa is they're going through a serotonin plunge. So um, what they're gonna experience is largely an uptick in their anxiety, 
an uptick in their OCD ruminations, and also an uptick in their, um, uh, did I say in inability to sleep as well? So those three things are sort of the trio of, of the most um, common symptomatology. And then when we add the serotonin precursors, like the tryptophan and 5-HTP, watching that smooth out um, is, is the clinical um, um, expertise that's led us to believe that you know there is a serotonin plunge that happens there. Uh, it's not unlike, honestly, a heroin plunge. Um, when people are coming off of heroin or coming off of uh, oxycodone or some sort of opiate, what happens is, is they've had this numbing agent in there and their body shut off the natural source. So uh, for a period of time, everything is painful. Their digestion is painful. The pressure of their eyelids on their eyeballs is painful. Taking a shower is painful um, until they can rebuild their endorphin levels. Well, that is what we believe is happening uh, on a serotonin level when coming off these drugs. There's a serotonin plunge, and then that um, will be what it is until the serotonin naturally rebounds. So. What we do here is, is uh, we add the serotonin precursors. Now, this is important. At the same time, we're going down. So imagine that the drug is going down and the serotonin precursors are going up, okay? So that there's a crossover that looks like a straight line. Now, there is a phenomenon called serotonin syndrome. If you double down on taking tryptophan and taking Selexa or another SSR at the same time, you could get too much serotonin, which could be fatal. Um, We've, I've never actually heard of this, I, except in the literature. Um, we haven't experienced it here in 15 years, um, and we wouldn't expect to either because we're taking away one at the same time we're integrating the other. Doing this long term is not something I would suggest. Um, you would definitely want to be under the guidance of some sort of professional if you're combining serotonin uh, precursors and your antidepressant medication out there. Don't do this one alone. Do this with support because obviously getting serotonin syndrome is a huge consequence if, uh, if you don't do it well. And again, it's only meant even here to be a transition. It's not meant to be a combination of things. Um, anyway, that's the end of our questions on this particular medication. I thank you very much for being with us either today or tonight. And um, I hope that things go well for you. You're welcome to uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can get more um, videos like this dropped into your um, into your viewing box. And um, also, please do not take anything that we've said here to be medical advice. We're not treating you. Um, at best, give this information to someone who is following your care that can um, use it and use that information to help guide you. Thank you very much.